Hello, how do you like my new intro music? Well, we'll keep working on it, but I think it makes the point. Okay, um, some of you may be aware there was a giant earthquake in Nepal overnight, and uh, there's a, a website called Suspicious Observers. That's an astronomy website. They do daily checks on the uh, sun weather, space weather. So anyway, we're going to play this morning's. This was this morning at 4 a.m. Florida time. I think it was Florida. Anyway, go ahead and let her rip. Good morning, folks, but not for everyone. Disaster has struck Asia as a 7.9 magnitude earthquake cracked just outside of the capital city of Nepal. Buildings are destroyed, streets cracked and lifted, avalanches in the mountains, including at Mount Everest where hikers have only recently begun to return. The death toll will take a while, but in some instances up to 400 people are trapped in one collapsed building. This is going to be a catastrophe. Please go back to yesterday's news if you have to for the earthquake factors that called for the enhanced quake alert yesterday. My one point of solace is that the buoy readings around the region are not showing tsunami simply a reverberation from the earthquake itself. The large earthquake was followed 30 minutes later by a solid aftershock. And since I know most of you are wondering, yes, there's a strong low pressure earth spot sitting right on the mountain range. We also took a strong earthquake on the Canadian west coast to follow up the five pointer in California from the day before. Of course, those dark patches incoming here on the sun are the coronal holes, our primary earthquake factor. But of course, now mixing with the planetary geometry and solar flare energies for this enhanced event. But while the earth is rocking, you can see the sun is pretty calm. We see no major eruptions and no big flashes from a solar flare. In fact, getting sea flares has been a bit of a struggle the last few hours. Sunspots do have a chance to change that as they head out of sight. Any CMEs wouldn't come our way, but as it turns, I see some mixing potential in the center. The lone eruption yesterday came south incoming and did not produce a major CME. Most of that filament fell and caused the surface surge. Solar wind, that's a calming trend, isn't it? Just take a look at these smooth curves returning to the sensitive flux. Know that Earth's shield will be doing just fine on a day like this. Our top eruption threat becomes the mega filament. Only a few days left until she faces Earth. Look at the size of this leviathan. At least nine solar tornadoes there. Couple links. Dawn is entering the light side view of Ceres, so images are going to come flooding in soon. We'll discuss a strange fact found by Brody Love in today's Fly on the Wall. Also got for you a piece from Hubble on a galaxy far, far away. Supernovas, peculiar features, Wookiees, Ewoks, pretty goofy place. Gotta come to the polar ice next, because indeed the Antarctic has broken ahead of last year's record marks and is breaking high ice records yet again, all while the cold event up north is continuing as well. Way above the trends, and no longer anywhere close to record low ice. Yesterday's top U.S. alerts did not disappoint. Major storms dropped along the convergence lines. I still got the western flow, and I'm eyeing the cool down in the northeast from that Canadian air, but again, top alerts will be for rapid storm formation and intensification along the convergence lines. In Europe, the Atlantic low has joined forces with one further north to create a large-scale low pattern flow that is actually getting the Mediterranean wind involved as well. It balloons out the cloud tracks to cover more of the continent today. Down under. Easy. That convergence line at New Zealand is by far the strongest weather feature we can see in the area, and indeed, it sends the moisture to the quake zone from two days ago. That's not a coincidence. I mentioned fly on the wall earlier. It is Saturday, so our hour-long podcast session will take place soon, right after the news, and be posted to the premium content in a few hours. Topics today are going to be very fun. Okay, so if you, uh, you know, got something out of that, and actually there's a, a, a lot you can learn about that if you go to Suspicious Observers. That's... Uh, uh, free on YouTube, so you don't have to worry about any money. Now, um, you probably didn't know it because the U.S. media did not cover it. Had, over the last two or three weeks, have you seen one single word about Israel slaughtering more Palestinians? No, they're, they're keeping that hush-hush, aren't they? Yeah, well, 90 Palestinians, 20 of them children. Well, George Galloway will tell the story the best, so let's listen to George Galloway. Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation, the great debate, but it can only be either if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls. The number is 44208-601-4555. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line, and remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be at zero. 
You can also SMS me on 447800008066. Or you can email me at comment at presstv.co.uk. You can even tweet me at comment underscore press TV. I'm raring to go. I hope you are. Because my blood is racing. It's red hot. Because I've been watching, because I watch alternative news channels rather than the so-called lamestream media, I've been watching mass murder. Mass murder most foul. A barbarous, unchecked, and even largely uncriticized. No calls for restraint. Where is the Middle East peace envoy? Is he calling for a ceasefire or is his silence? Like the silence of most of the political class, Ed Miliband, for example, has he gone on holiday? Uh, I haven't heard a single word from him. That silence from the political class is, of course, complicity with the mass murder that the rest of us with access to information have been watching for the last two weeks. More than 90 Palestinians have been massacred, 90. And more than 20 of those have been small children. Every one of them a militant, every one of them a terrorist. Uh, there's no silence, though, in the media. The media is very clear. Israel is under attack. No one's been killed. On the Israeli side, no one's even been injured. No one's actually been scratched on the Israeli side. But hey, their dinner has been regularly disturbed by sirens. And the streets are empty because some of them have gone to bomb shelters. Would that the Palestinian people in Gaza had bomb shelters or anywhere to hide, anywhere to run? Because, of course, they don't. The nearly two million Palestinians inside the Gaza Strip are locked up for the duration. Every door, every gate locked against them, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, in a very, very small piece of territory containing the most densely populated population anywhere on the earth. The Israeli apologists sometimes say, why are the terrorists hiding amongst the people? Well, of course, there is no place for anybody to go in Gaza. Everyone is piled on top of each other. The Israeli apologists claim that Israel is targeting weapons. But of course, when a warship off the coast barks its shells at the territory uh, that they patrol, they're not targeting anyone. They're just firing hot, molten steel. And that hot, razor-sharp, molten steel and the sheets of breaking glass are tearing the Palestinian people to pieces, decimating them. More than 80 have been killed, but about 500 have been wounded. Mortuaries are closing. Hospitals are unable to cope. Ambulance drivers are being deliberately targeted. It's the old, old story. Someone sent me today a speech I gave in 2009, which mirrors almost word for word what I've just said to you now. Nobody did anything about it then. Nobody's doing anything about it now. In fact, in fact, it's worse than that. The only two forces ready to stand up, who've already stood up, to the mass murderers of what they call Israel are two people that some people want Muslims to hate. Saeed Hassan Nasrallah in a masterful speech this week, the leader of Hezbollah, which delivered, of course, in 2006, Israel's only ever defeat on the battlefield by any army, was standing shoulder to shoulder, four square with the Palestinian people. Indeed, the Hezbollah has already been of great military assistance to the resistance inside Gaza. And the other, of course, is Iran. Now, there is a class of sectarian idiot in the Muslim world who wants us to hate Iran, wants us to hate Syed Hassan Nasrallah, wants us to hate Hezbollah. That has morphed into a situation because everybody knows that the only weapons that the Palestinian resistance has inside Gaza came from those that we are being asked to hate. So that morphs into hating the Palestinians themselves, ignoring them, ignoring them, except where you're actually blaming them. That's happening right now in Egypt, for example, where the mass media of the military junta of General Sisi is actually blaming the Palestinians for the murderous assault that has been unleashed against them. The killing of young people has captured imagination around the whole world by the public by the police. The settlers uh, who just last week captured, tortured, poured gasoline down the throat of a Palestinian teenager in Jerusalem before setting him on fire are sitting on deck chairs watching the bombardment of Gaza. 
they are actually watching as a kind of spectator sport what's being done in the settler state of Israel. Not only did that young man just get burned alive, these bullies there beat his cousin, an American citizen, to a pulp. I don't know about you, I've come to expect mass murder from a state which was founded on mass murder. Mass murder of anybody, of the British, mass murder of United Nations uh, officials, mass murder of villages like Deir Yassin, mass murder of the Palestinians, mass murder of the refugees in Sabra and Shatila, mass murder in Jenin. I expect that from them. They are mass murderers. What I'm more interested in is three things. First of all, where are the Arab leaders? Where are the Muslim leaders? Where is the Ummah that they teach us about in school? As a young Palestinian girl said to me after caste led in 2009-2010. Where is the Ummah that they teach us about in school? Why did they leave us to face this alone? Why did they leave us to face this alone? Secondly, I'm interested in where are the British and other political leaders? David Cameron says that he staunchly supports Israel in this action. Ed Miliband has gone missing. Where are all these champions of human rights? Human rights in Syria, for example. Human rights in Iraq before the invasion. Where are they? And the third question I'm interested in is what to do about the despicable, repulsive, culpable mass media that misserves the public of Western countries, one of which the so-called British Broadcasting Corporation were forced to pay for on pain of imprisonment if we don't. And the second question that we are dealing with this evening is a question we've had to deal with these last few weeks. We're asking what has been your country's reaction to ISIL's atrocities? Another 35 executed men uncovered by Iraqi security forces just this week. ISIL are Al-Qaeda, or at least they were Al-Qaeda, until Al-Qaeda kicked them out as being just too brutal, just too cruel, just too fanatical, just too sectarian. And if you're too sectarian for Al-Qaeda, what does that make you? And yet, not a single thing has been done by any Western government to check the advance of ISIL in Iraq. It is now an inescapable, ineluctable conclusion that the Western governments are in league with ISIL. If they were not, they'd already be bombing them, wouldn't they? Well, to answer your question, uh, no, we're just about as trustworthy as any other backstabber you can think of. Uh, everybody that we have ever befriended, whether it was Saddam, whether it was Gaddafi, whether it was Momar, uh, what's his name, the uh, Panama guy? Uh, Noriega. Noriega, that's, thank you. Yeah, every one of them did our bidding, and we were good buddies with them, and then we stabbed them in the back. So don't think that we won't go bombing the people that we sent in, and they're just a little bit too stupid to figure that out, I think. I don't understand. I mean, they're, they're not stupid. But why would they keep allowing them themselves to, to be the, uh, the patsy over and over again where, you know, anytime we want to bomb somewhere, we send in ISIS or Al-Qaeda, and then we blow them up. You know, why would anybody be our ally after that? I mean, th our history is right there. Okay, well, now we're going to move on to something more local. Remember we were talking about Jade Helm 15? It's the uh, military training op that's, what, 23 states or something now? It's the biggest military training exercise ever. And uh, make no mistake about it, they're preparing to fight you and me. And no doubt about it, that's not paranoia. And we're going to uh, go to an uh, Infowars.com clip. But they're also going to be talking about something near and dear to our hearts. Did you know that uh, the Bureau of Land Management is trying to uh, take away the mine from some miners in southern Oregon? The uh, Oath Keepers are surrounding them to protect them from the feds? Oh boy, let's listen to this one then. Before we go to the press conference, uh, there's a couple of protests coming up, very important ones. We talked earlier about uh, the gold mine out in uh, Oregon 
Now, the uh, BLM was moving against uh, some miners who'd had a, a mine there since the 1870s. And uh, there was, the BLM was talking like they were going to uh, take it uh, by force this coming Saturday, just two days away. We had uh, Oath Keepers go out there and set up a security perimeter to protect the people there from any kind of uh, precipitative uh, movement by the BLM like that because they wanted to go through the legal proceedings, get due process. They were not giving them their day in court. They said, we need to at least have a day in court because we have rights to this mine that we've kept a chain of title going yes. back to the 1870s. So they've got uh, protests that are scheduled today. I just want to let people who are in the area know about that. That's going to be at uh, uh, 2 p.m. Central Time. It's going to be noon Pacific Time for the people who are out there. They're going to have a uh, rally at the BLM offices. And after that information came out, the BLM said, uh, well, we're going to close our offices. So it looks like the BLM is backing down. They're going. Uh, they're not in aggressive mode right now. They're not even going to uh, uh, have those offices open because of the protests. But it was an interesting press release from them. They said that, uh, and they called on people, they said, they're calling on all miners, loggers, farmers, ranchers, and freedom lovers everywhere. It said, if you can't get to the BLM out there in Oregon, go to your local BLM office and protest uh, what they're doing. Tell the people, uh, tell them that the people of this country are sick and tired of the way they've been conducting themselves. So today at uh, noon central, and I'm sorry, noon Pacific time, that'd be about two o'clock uh, central at the end of uh, the show. Also, there was um, a lot of pushback against Jade Helm here locally. Yes. Bastrop is the uh, uh, city that is just uh, southeast of Austin. And that was the first one listed on the uh, Jade Helm cities. There's been a lot of concern there. And I think this actually made the Drudge Report, uh, the fact that they're going to have another county commissioner meeting. And that's going to be this Monday, April 27th, uh, for people to show up and express their concern about the military exercises that are being held there. They say this will, they will again present information to the county commissioners because they did this secretly and in privately with nobody paying any attention to this a couple of months ago. That's what they did in all these locations. Now there's so many people in Bastrop that they're going to uh, basically start their PSYOP operation a little bit before the exercise because they said this is a PSYOP operation. They need a running start. Yeah. And people who will you know, criticize us even questioning Jade Helm, it's not so much Jade Helm it's the larger picture because you think about, I know you did a report about this, David, how they're running drills in Miami, Florida. Yeah. What cave in Afghanistan looks like downtown Miami, Florida, doing drills in Minneapolis, doing drills in San Diego? Yeah. What desert in Iraq looks like San Diego, California? You know, exactly. so it's just basic stuff. What are these guys training for? And when you ask this question, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, it's this, I just really want to know. You know, you wouldn't put on football cleats and go run on a hardwood basketball court. You know, you train where you're going to deploy. And they said that in L.A. When they were doing these drills in L.A., they got on uh, the local news and they were talking to the guy and he says, well, you train where you're going to fight. If you're going to yep. fight the mountains or the desert, that's where you train. We're training to fight here. And they were working in conjunction with the police. And so uh, when we look at this drill right here, this is an article. We're going to talk to Paul Joseph Watson about this. Uh, these are some Marines now training in riot control. Why would you have Marines training in riot control? This is very disturbing, but it's all part of a, a, a pattern that we've seen going back. You talked about the report we did. That was back in 2013. And of course, last year, Joe Biggs and I went to uh, one of the places where they were training for this in AP Hill. There's a separate base inside of AP Hill uh, that was uh, fenced off. We walked through that. And here's the thing, Jakari. If they want to train for urban warfare, they've been doing that in the past. They have these uh, burned out, bombed out building shells that they can go around and they can practice going uh, building to building. But when you go to the uh, uh, Asymmetric Warfare Center in uh, AP Hill, this is a completely intact city. Yes. Okay, completely intact. Had a subway. The traffic lights were working. Yeah, they had the subway. They had all the different uh, transportation modes there. And, of course, in Camp Lejeune, they have, uh, that's where the Marine base is, they have another city that they train with there. That's why it's not a surprise for me to see that the Marines are working on crowd control and riot gear there because the one that they have at uh, Camp Lejeune is a more rural setting. There, it's, it's more suburban stuff. It's also farm areas. But it's very much America. Mm -hmm. When we were at AP Hill uh, at the Asymmetric Warfare Center, we stood at the corner of 1st and Main. We saw traffic lights that were operational. They are training to go through a city that hasn't been attacked, isn't part of a war zone. And I very much object to this. But this is what the Jade Helm exercise is. It's moving this out to the next level. We're seeing this happening everywhere. Part of this is a PSYOP operation. The entire thing is, at the very least, a PSYOP operation to get troops used to operating in America on the streets and to get the people of America used to seeing them on the streets, just as if we were living in a banana republic with nuclear weapons, which we are. Yeah. Yeah, which we exactly. are. Exactly. Okay, so we're going to go to another Alex Jones clip uh, again with uh, David Knight and uh, Leanne McAdoo. But what, or no, this time it's with uh, uh, Jakari, Jakari Jackson. Yeah, sorry. Just trying to do this all from memory. We don't have our uh, teleprompters like uh, Mr. Obama. But anyway, uh, speaking of Mr. Obama, our, I, what is wrong with our politicians? Fast track? You gave President Obama the fast track to fast track TPP? It's the end of the world, folks. Ah. Anyway, let's, let's play this one. 
Well, a deal has been reached on fast track authority for President Obama so he can go on ahead and finish negotiating one of the world's largest trade deals. Of course, we're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, but that's not all. Now, joining me in studio is David Knight. David, so this fast track authority is just unprecedented. Here we have the Republicans now siding with Obama, whereas the Democrats are saying, hold up, we shouldn't do this. What's going on? Well, it's actually been a bipartisan thing when they had NAFTA passed because George H.W. Bush, when he was running for re-election against Clinton, they were both pushing NAFTA. And the only person speaking out against it at the time was Ross Perot. He's talking about a giant sucking sound. Well, of course, that's not just the money. That's also your sovereignty that's going down the drain. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that bothers me the most is the fact that we have this fast track process. In other words, we can have, should have a public discussion about what's in this. It ought to be our representatives who are deciding this, who are crafting this. Instead, as they do in so many different ways with the bureaucracy, uh, with the BLM, or with, whether it's the IRS, or these various agencies, the EPA, they let them go their own way. They abdicate their legislative authority that they should be doing. Basically do nothing but fundraising is what they're doing now. So they pass this off to these corporate lobbyists who are doing this secretively. Right. And so what we've had here now is a bipartisan agreement with the leaders of the Republican Party, as well as uh, the leaders of the Democrat Party, with Obama, saying, we're not going to have this as an open process. Mm. They're going to have a vote on it, okay? And they say they're going to give them more time instead of just dumping it in, in a couple of days on them. Of course, they fast-tracked this agreement. So I guess, I'm not sure if we can trust them to actually give people enough time to look at the thousands of pages. But it's going to be this massive omnibus bill, mm -hmm. just like they do with the budget bill every year, just like they do with the NDAA. And you know all the stuff that they cram into the NDAA. Right. Okay, the Section 1033, uh, the 1023, indefinite detention without trial, all this stuff. Even John McCain's bill to hand over to a foreign corporation the uh, copper mining rights to this area of Arizona. It's going to devastate the area. But that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing we're going to see with these trading partnerships. Right, and a lot of people who are against this are arguing that trade deals in the past have failed to deliver on their promises. Yes. And they've you know, made the country much worse, put it in a much worse uh, position. But here that they're saying that you know, Obama, President Obama is embracing this legislation. He's saying it's going to level the playing field, give our workers a fair shot. And for the first time, it will include strong, fully enforceable protections for workers' rights, the environment, and a free and open Internet. But that's not really what we've been hearing just from no. the things that have leaked. That's right. The only information that we really have from this is what WikiLeaks has leaked to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, WikiLeaks, because we can't get the truth from our legislative uh, representatives. And we're not getting the truth, certainly, from Obama. Obama is basically referring to NAFTA. It's like, okay, we lied to you about an, a NAFTA. Okay, it was a horrible deal. We've lost 61% of our manufacturing. Uh, and we've gone into debt with a trade deficit every year. And the last 14 years have been 14 record trade deficits. But that's okay. This is going to be all different. Right. Trust me, okay? What they're not even talking about, Leanne, is that it's, it's worse than just the economic aspects of it. There's also the sovereignty issues of it. And we're seeing the sovereignty issues come into play. People are talking about it gradually now. We see Petraeus and Pelosi talking about, yeah, we don't have America anymore. Yeah, we don't have national borders anymore. Uh, it just doesn't matter to them anymore. Now they're talking about the sovereignty issues with NAFTA as they're putting this next level to. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially these building blocks to a global world governance that is run by corporations. One of the few things that they did, they threw them a bone and said, yeah, okay, we haven't really been telling you about what's going on, so we're going to give you a chief transparency officer. <laughs> what a load of malarkey that is. that like the Ebola czar? <laughs> exactly. So effective? <laughs> yeah, we've gotten czars before, so now we've got a chief transparency officer who's going to talk to us. We're going to wind up with Investor State Dispute Settlement Court, mm -hmm. okay? And that basically has the multinational corporations at the same level as states in terms of if they, if they see that there's something that they think impacts their business or their profits, they can sue the nation. And we've already seen that happen with NAFTA, although it's not being reported by the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. These proceedings are pretty hard to find because they're done in secret, in arbitration. But we know it's going to happen. It's already happened here. There's been billions of dollars turned over from American taxpayers to these multinational corporations because their profits were impacted by regulation. It might be, for example, let's talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Let's say that they decide in Japan that they want to restrict uh, nuclear power because of Fukushima, or they want to shut that down. Mm -hmm. Well, these companies can come back and say, you're, you're impacting our profits, so you pay us. Mm -hmm. That's how this could turn out. Wow. And we're already seeing that type of issue crop up with uh, countries denying Monsanto and other yeah. biopharmaceutical um, geoengineering, things like that, from entering their country. That's right. And so now they're saying, well, you're cutting into our profits. But here are the differences is now they're going to be uh, taking them to these independent tribunals where someone outside of everyone's... When they say that this is going to be a big win for American agricultural uh, products, what they're talking about is forcing on these other countries are genetically modified organisms mm -hmm. that they have outlawed in their countries, and rightfully so. Right. There, there's a massive uh, influx of organic products and having to import them to satisfy demand in America because the American corporations just want to give us this synthetic garbage. Mm -hmm. But other countries have basically said, no, you're not going to do that. So they're going to use this treaty to override that. They're going to use this treaty to control the internet, to do things that they could not pass legislatively like CISPA, that they've tried repeatedly to, and, and failed. They're going to use digital rights to try to control the internet. There's a lot of things in here besides trade, but it is fundamentally about uh, sovereignty and what people should be really angry about is the fact that our elected representatives have enabled the corporate lobbyists to write these rules. 
and have just abdicated any responsibility uh, for, for having anything to do with it. It's going to come in with an up or down vote. They're going to say it's too important. I had to vote for this, this, and this. I know that was bad, but I had to it was a take it all or leave it all. That's the way this is going to go down. Yeah, absolutely. And they're, everyone's concerned because it's taken a few years for this to pass. Well, there's a reason why. It's because it's such a huge trade deal. It's going to affect so many different sectors around the world. And we know that it's absolutely going to impact jobs because of something that they've had to include in this package along the way to get Democrats to go along with it. Uh, trade adjustment assistance. So this is trade adjustment assistance. It's going to be aid to workers whose jobs are displaced by global trade. Let me tell you how that's going to work out. Okay, we're just looking at this thing in Oregon where they were coming against the miners, the BLM. They're very, it's an economically very depressed area because the U.S. Forestry Service shut down logging in that area. Now, understand that in the national parks, it's not clear-cut logging. They're going in in the past. They would go in and they would take standing deadwood out, which reduces the chances of a catastrophic fire. Like we saw here in Bastrop, just outside of Austin, where it burned uh, 99% of the uh, state park that was there. Or like we saw in Yellowstone. Devastating wildfires because they, the policy now is not what it used to be. I had an uncle who was a, a head of the forestry department at the University of Missouri, and that is irresponsible to manage the forest that way. It was a win-win situation. You could uh, control wildfires and you could have an economy there. They took that down, and instead what they did was they gave welfare payments to the people who had previously made money in the logging industry. After mm -hmm. 10 years, they stopped that. That's what's going to happen to this. They're right. going to ease the transition into a servitude state. Right. Because we're not only we're now at the point where we're losing our service jobs as well as our manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lowered wage base. But again, it's not even about that. It's about the sovereignty and it's about the fact that our congressmen and senators would abdicate the responsibility to pass these laws. And we've got right. all the Republicans doing it, all the Republicans who are running for president. And you've got Obama doing it. There's a civil war in the Democrat Party, and they always run these things through with a Democrat president. Clinton ran through NAFTA and you got Obama to run through Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Partnership, TTIP. Uh, that's where they're going to put it through because uh, everybody would smell a, uh, a rotten fish if it was coming through from the Republicans. They right. would say this is nothing but corporatism. And that's what it is. It's corporatism. Right. This is not free trade any more than the bank bailouts were capitalism or free markets. It's not free markets. It's right. only capitalism. And that's why it's so obvious when you see the, the, the Republicans rallying around this and trying to let this be Obama's one big thing that he can push through before yeah. 2016 happens. It's oh, absolutely. Quite they say it, it defines his legacy. Well, you know what it does define? It defines these presidential candidates for us. Mm. Because you have to look at this and say, why would they do this? Are they bought and sold? They can't be that stupid. I, I really can't believe that they're that stupid. That they could look at NAFTA and make the same mistakes again, see where that is leading, but that they would abdicate their responsibility to make the laws to make treaties. Well, just one last thing. I mean, do you think that this is, you know, they're telling us, well, we've got to do this now or we won't have any time to turn back. Is this because of what is happening with China and Russia and, and a lot of the other BRICS countries moving away from the, the dollar? So now we've got to get our presence there and America will be... There is. They always more. try to put that kind of pressure on us. If there's any pressure, it's because they've had this 2020, 2025 uh, time frame where they've been talking about radically changing civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's what they're really concerned about. Maybe that's really their time frame. I don't know. All I can say is it is absolutely is not necessary. Uh, it is going to be a very harmful thing. And we need people to understand and get a bigger picture about this. This isn't something that only the unions should be standing up against. Mm -hmm. Republicans need to understand that this is anti-business. This is going to shut down small businesses. It is absolutely going to crush them under the weight of the multinationals because it's being written by those guys. And you're going to lose the free market. You're not going to have free trade. You're not even going to have a free market inside your country. They're going to shut down the small guys. And it's going to be a great uh, a step towards concentration of wealth, even much greater than we've seen, and it's going to be much faster than we've seen. Wow. Well, thank you, David. And it is especially so important for all of us to speak out now as we have these candidates out there putting their hats in the game to run for the president to just speak up and let them know that we're not going to be pimped out anymore to corporate America or to the new world order. Okay, we're all the resistance. We, you know, it depends on all of us. Now, uh, we have a problem in America, it's called systemic racism, institutionalized racism. Uh, it's, I'm not just talking about your average white guy hating black guys or something like that. That's basically, you know, that only matters on a person-to-person -person basis and, you know, you're going to get your ass beat if you act like that, uh, if you think like that. So, but the problem that we have is that the government right now is doing everything it possibly can to divide the whites and blacks and browns and get us pointing at each other, you know, you're the problem of my bank account. That's why I don't have a big bank account because of you. You, you took my job, you know, and all that sort of crap. It's all just crap. If you ever fostered one of those thoughts, get rid of it because it's, it was put there to divide and it's a lie so what we're going to do is go to there we're going to have three clips and they're all covering the same type of subject the um 
Anyway, this is the Real News Network, and I'll just let it speak for itself. Hello, my name is Stephen Janis, and I'm an investigative reporter for the Real News Network in Baltimore. Thank you for joining us in our continuing conversation with A. Dwight Pettit, a noted civil rights lawyer who has sued the police department in multiple cases of police brutality. And we are discussing today the case uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, where an officer shot a man five, eight times in the back as he was running away. Mr. Pettit, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. So one of the things uh, that you've noted we discuss quite often is policing is a big business in this town. For a lawyer like you to go against this huge organization, what are the challenges you face when you have a case where someone's shot in the back of, of trying to make your case in court? Well, we have a very, very, very uh, conservative uh, city solicitor's office in this case. And you know, we've had a very conservative state's attorney's office and elections might have just changed that. And so we don't have much cooperation because we, don't, we can't expect that there's gonna be a criminal prosecution. In most cases, more cases than not, there's not gonna be a criminal prosecution. And so that would usually lend itself to us getting some investigatory help from the state by getting their files if there is a criminal prosecution. And we have a very conservative uh, city solicitor's office which just about denies everything in conjunction with the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, and puts everything uh, right at the step of the, of the courtroom. So in most cases, uh, we don't have any type of investigatory uh, help in terms of uh, uh, city agencies or state agencies. And so it becomes quite difficult in terms of uh, getting the evidence through discovery when we bring the suit, because we don't get anything until we bring it. We bring the action, we get discovery and so forth. We, we get uh, uh, the autopsy and those type of things. We have a case now that uh, we're working on where a young man was beat to death, uh, Tyrone West. We've been fighting for the full autopsy for a year now. And you still don't have the autopsy? We, still, we don't have all of the things that were made up that went into the autopsy in terms of their decisions that he was uh, the subject of a heart attack or uh, some pre-existing condition. And why that's kept so secret, that's what we think is possibly part of what will go to, to the jury when the trial uh, goes forward. But these things we have to bring in experts, uh, to in fact uh, go against the police experts who always conclude the same thing, that the shooting or the killing was reasonable. So we have a, we have a hard ladder uh, to, to go up and there's no question about it. And just so people know, Tyrone West died in police custody and- Yep, up in, in uh, uh, Northeast Baltimore. Uh, beat uh, to death by something like 10 to 11 officers. Stomped, tasered, uh, beat with batons, sticks, beat with fists, who basically, uh, they admit that the beating uh, took place. Uh, and they the even city. said they took a break during it, right? Yes, because uh, he, had, he had run a few distance. He was going, going, uh, when he was running up the hill, he was thrown down on his face. According to witnesses, he was, you know, you got me, please stop beating me. Uh, and they beat him until, in fact, he uh, was rendered unconscious. And, and the officers were not charged in that case? No, nobody was charged. No, that's right. uh, just like you probably remember the Anderson case was a young man Anderson, yeah. uh, that was picked up and body slammed. And the, an interesting thing about it, some of these officers are the same officers in the various cases, uh, they're repeats because they've never, been, they've never been brought to justice, Steve, because there's no price to pay, there's no penalty to pay. In many cases, I found, believe it or not, that in many cases, these officers are promoted. It's almost like a blue badge of courage that you killed somebody. And so they, they're not gonna be prosecuted. Uh, they are limited in the damages by the cap. And if you get a, a, a sizable judgment uh, that's that some kind of way exceeds the cap or close to the cap, the city's gonna pick up, according to the FOP agreement, is gonna pick up the liability. So what sanction do you have uh, that you should do the right thing? None. Well, I want to ask you a question. Um, how much does this have to do with race? I mean, if the victim or the person who dies in police custody is African American, um, how ha much harder is it? Or is, it, is this part of the problem that this is, you know, a, a, a sort of a product of racism? Well, it's a product of racism, but it's so systemic, systemic uh, that it seems to be something that has spread throughout the police departments, uh, both African Americans as well as, as white police officers, that to use the cliche that black life does not matter, uh, that this is acceptable conduct, uh, that this is something that you will not be prosecuted nor will you be persecuted. Uh, and so therefore it sort of transcends, begins to transcend uh, individual uh, officers in terms of their race and becomes more or less a, uh, a policy and procedure, uh, which gives us federal jurisdiction in many cases, of people acting under color of law pursuant to what is legal and authorized and accepted uh, in the police department. And so the culture has to be changed at the top uh, from, the, from the mayor's office to the city's Office to the police commissioner's office. It's got to be changed mentally and across this nation that this conduct is not acceptable and you will be, in fact, be disciplined. And that, that has not been instilled at this point in time. We have a mayor uh, that went down to Annapolis, as we've discussed, and tried to get certain legislation passed. Uh, but we found that the legislative body in terms of Maryland basically repudiated and rejected everything that was suggested uh, from both uh, the mayor as well as uh, certain elements in the, in the, in the uh, community in terms of uh, the racial aspect of it and in terms of the non-racial aspect of it. But, uh, everything was rejected as not acceptable, and, and uh, it's, that goes back to the, to the state of mind that the public is saying that this conduct is acceptable in trade-off for the necessary policing that we want in our community to protect us. We'll give up certain civil rights. 
And how do you explain that in the African-American community? Where, because most of these victims, almost all of them are African-American. Why are they accepting of this type of police misconduct that negatively affects the community here? Because the African-American community is so, uh, you might say, uh, upset about the, right, rightfully so, uh, the issue of crime. For example, you see that a lot of folks are saying, well, what about black on black crime? That's a separate issue. Because black on black crime, you're still subject to the penal system, you're subject to prosecution. What we're saying in terms of the police departments, that their crimes are not, in fact, answerable. That they have a pass and have a license to the fact to inflict these criminal acts on the community and not be subject to any penalty. That's the main distinction. But the black community is allowed to, or does in fact, sometimes blur this because of the apprehension and the fear of such rampant crime in the urban community that they're willing to trade off. Uh, their rights and, and their uh, bringing attention uh, to what racism might be involved in, in return for what they believe to be adequate policing and protection. Now, you, you see a break in that now in terms of uh, citizens coming forward in terms of, of cooperating with the police because you can't cooperate with the police if you're scared to call the police. Uh, and so we see that that is now uh, the embryonic stage of, uh, of uh, apprehension in the black community uh, with the police department, where before with officer friendly, that may not have been the case. People would come forward, cooperate, give names, what they saw and what have you. Nowadays, nobody wants to do that because uh, they don't know how that in involves them and how that uh, uh, will be interpreted or how that mixed relationship with the police department will come back to haunt them. In the case of Michael Johnson, who was 15 years old, he was taken or kidnapped, it was alleged to have been kidnapped from West Baltimore, taken and dropped off in Howard County uh, without his shoes. You sued and successfully won, but then there was another, this was another twist of that case in terms of collecting the money uh, that sort of speaks to this problem of police accountability. Could you explain what happened in that case? Well, in that particular case, the, the irony and the horror of that case is not only a young man was taken out to Howard County, he was taken, shoes were taken, cell phone was broken, he was thrown out in the rain uh, about 15 miles outside of Baltimore City. He was, he called the Howard County Police. It was the Howard County Police Department that brought him back, took a statement and, and verified everything that took place. But the horror of the case is that we settled the case uh, with the police department for $150,000. Uh, then the mayor and the board of estimates reneged even after there was a recommendation from the city solicitor's office to settle it. We went to trial. We got a $500,000 verdict from a jury. The case went up on appeal, which was denied. And now the city is asking the highest court in the, in the state, the Court of Appeals, to review the case on the issue of whether or not the, the cap, the court, the court of Special Appeals, ruled that the cap was not applicable uh, to individual police officers. And in fact, the jury found malice. And in this particular case, the jury did find malice. And but that case, it, it goes, it's the prime example of the establishment of falling in line with this blue badge, of this, 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 this circle of blue badge in, in terms of deny everything, concede nothing, and everybody lie. Uh, 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 cover up, hide, instead of when certain things taking place, instead of the administration, the police department, the police commissioner, and the mayor's office saying, okay, this was a bad shooting, or it's wrong, let's prosecute the police department, and let's compensate the families for the damage done to them. We don't have that mental attitude, uh, not in this state, and obviously we don't have it in, in most of the nation. So, you know, we talked about this before, you know, you've been doing this for almost 42 years. What keeps you going, you know, as an attorney fighting these cases, sometimes an uphill battle? Well, I, I didn't, Steve, it wasn't my purpose to get, I was into civil rights in terms of Title VII and equal opportunity and what have you. This is something, as I say in my book, Under Color of Law, this is something that sort of developed in my practice over the years. And in fact, I say in the book that this is the new civil rights issue of the 21st century. And it's, so it's not something that I looked at and, and intently went into it was something that just developed and as it developing uh, in its developing it was something that I couldn't shy away from uh, because I did always feel coming out of Howard University Law School that I have a commitment to the community uh, and I saw that was based in civil rights and so when this new monster began to surface its ugly head uh, it was like uh, I was compelled to continue uh, in this area of litigation and uh, try to undo some of the wrongs that have been done and bring some justice to the community uh, even though the powers that be uh, stand strongly in opposition to that. Well, I've read your book. I highly recommend it. And listen, Mr. Pettit, I really appreciate you talking with us about this. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, Steve. Good to see you. And my name is Stephen Janis. I'm an investigative reporter for The Real News Network, reporting from Baltimore. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so we're just going to go straight into the, the next part of this one, uh, part two, the same, same interviewer and the same interviewee. Continuing conversation with A. Dwight Pettit, a noted civil rights lawyer who has sued the police department in multiple cases of police brutality. And we are discussing today the case uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, where an officer shot a man five, eight times in the back as he was running away. Mr. Pettit, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. So one of the things uh, that you know that we discuss quite often is policing is a big business in this town. For a lawyer like you to go against this huge organization, what are the challenges you face when you have a case where someone's shot in the back of, of trying to make your case in court? Well, we have a very, very, very uh, conservative 
uh, city solicitor's office in this case. And you know we've had a very conservative state attorney's office and elections might have just changed that. And so we don't have much cooperation because we, don't, we can't expect that there's gonna be a criminal prosecution. In most cases, more cases than not, there's not gonna be a criminal prosecution. And so that would usually lend itself to us getting some investigatory help from the state by getting their files if there is a criminal prosecution. And we have a very conservative uh, city solicitor's office which just about denies everything in conjunction with the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police, and puts everything uh, right at the step of the, of the courtroom. So in most cases, uh, we don't have any type of investigatory uh, help in terms of uh, uh, city agencies or state agencies. And so it becomes quite difficult in terms of uh, getting the evidence through discovery when we bring the suit, because we don't get anything until we bring it. We bring the action, we get discovery and so forth. We, we get. Uh, uh, the autopsy and those type of things. We have a case now that uh, we're working on where a young man was beat to death, uh, Tyrone West. We've been fighting for the full autopsy for a year now. And you still don't have the autopsy? We, still, we don't have all of the things that were made up that went into the autopsy in terms of their decisions that he was uh, the subject of a heart attack or uh, some pre-existing condition. And why that's kept so secret, that's what we think is possibly part of what will go to, to the jury when the trial uh, goes forward. But these things we have to bring in experts, uh, to in fact uh, go against the police experts who always conclude the same thing, that the shooting or the killing was reasonable. So we have a, we have a hard ladder uh, to, to go up and it's no question about it. And just so people know, Tyrone West died in police custody and... Yep, up in, in uh, on northeast Baltimore. Uh, beat uh, to death by something like 10 to 11 officers. Stomped, tasered, uh, beat with batons, sticks, beat with fists, who basically, uh, they admit that the beating uh, took place. Uh, and they the even city. said they took a break during it, right? Yes, because uh, he, had, he had run a few distance. He was, when he was running up the hill, he was thrown down on his face. According to witnesses, he was, you know, you got me, please stop beating me. Uh, and they beat him until, in fact, he uh, was rendered unconscious. And, and the officers were not charged in that case? No, nobody was charged. No, that's right. uh, just like you probably remember the Anderson case was a young man Anderson, yeah. uh, that was picked up and body slammed. And an interesting thing about it, some of these officers are the same officers in the various cases, uh, they're repeats because they've never, been, they've never been brought to justice, Steve, because there's no price to pay, there's no penalty to pay. In many cases, I found, believe it or not, that in many cases, these officers are promoted. It's almost like a blue badge of courage that you killed somebody. And so they, they're not gonna be prosecuted. Uh, they are limited in the damages by the cap. And if you get a, a, a sizable judgment uh, that's, that some kind of way exceeds the cap or close to the cap, the city's gonna pick up, according to the FOP agreement, is gonna pick up the liability. So what sanction do you have uh, that you should do the right thing? None. Well, I want to ask you a question. Um, how much does this have to do with race? I mean, if the victim or the person who dies in police custody is African American, um, how h much harder is it? Or is, it, is this part of the problem that this is, you know, a, a, a sort of a product of racism? Well, it's a product of racism, but it's so systemic, systemic uh, that it seems to be something that has spread throughout the police departments, uh, both African Americans as well as, as white police officers, that to use the cliche that black life does not matter, uh, that this is acceptable conduct, uh, that this is something that you will not be prosecuted nor will you be persecuted. Uh, and so therefore it sort of transcends, begins to transcend uh, individual uh, officers in terms of their race and becomes more or less a, uh, a policy and procedure, uh, which gives us federal jurisdiction in many cases, of people acting under color of law, pursuant to what is legal and authorized and accepted uh, in the police department. And so the culture has to be changed at the top, uh, from, the, from the mayor's office to the city solicitor's office to the police commissioner's office. It's got to be changed mentally and across this nation that this conduct is not acceptable and you will be, in fact be disciplined. And that, that has not been instilled at this point in time. We have a mayor uh, that went down to Annapolis, as we've discussed, and tried to get certain legislation passed. Uh, but we found that the legislative body in terms of Maryland basically repudiated and rejected everything that was suggested uh, from both uh, the mayor as well as uh, certain elements in the, in the, in the uh, community in terms of uh, the racial aspect of it and in terms of the non-racial aspect of it. But, uh, everything was rejected as non-acceptable, and, and uh, it's, that goes back to the, to the state of mind that the public is saying that this conduct is acceptable in trade-off for the necessary policing that we want in our community to protect us. We'll give up certain civil rights. And how do you explain that in the African-American community? Where, because most of these victims, almost all of them are African-American. Why are they accepting of this type of police misconduct that negatively affects the community here? Because the African-American community is so, uh, you might say, uh, upset about the, right, rightfully so. Uh, the issue of crime. For example, you see that a lot of folks are saying, well, what about black on black crime? That's a separate issue. Because black on black crime, you're still subject to the penal system, you're subject to prosecution. What we're saying in terms of the police departments, that their crimes are not, in fact, answerable. That they have a pass and have a license to the fact to inflict these criminal acts on the community and not be subject to any penalty. That's the main distinction. But the black community is allowed to, or does in fact, sometimes blur this because of the apprehension and the fear of such rampant crime in the urban community that they're willing to trade off 
uh, their rights and, and they're uh, bringing attention uh, to what racism might be involved in, in return for what they believe to be adequate policing and protection. Now, you, you see a break in that now in terms of uh, citizens coming forward in terms of, of cooperating with the police because you can't cooperate with the police if you're scared to call the police. Uh, and so we see that that is now uh, the embryonic stage of, uh, of uh, apprehension in the black community uh, with the police department, where before with officer friendly, that may not have been the case. People would come forward, cooperate, give names, what they saw and what have you. Nowadays, nobody wants to do that because uh, they don't know how that Im involves them and how that uh, uh, will be interpreted or how that mixed relationship with the police department will come back to haunt them. In the case of Michael Johnson, who was 15 years old, he was taken or kidnapped, was alleged to have been kidnapped from West Baltimore, taken and dropped off in Howard County uh, without his shoes. You sued and successfully won, but then there was another, this was another twist of that case in terms of collecting the money uh, that sort of speaks to this problem of police accountability. Could you explain what happened in that case? Well, in that particular case, the, the irony and the horror of that case is not only a young man was taken out to Howard County, he was taken, his shoes were taken, his cell phone was broken, he was thrown out in the rain uh, about 15 miles outside of Baltimore City. He was, he called the Howard County Police. It was the Howard County Police Department that brought him back, took a statement and, and verified everything that took place. But the horror of the case is that we settled the case uh, with the police department for $150,000. Uh, then the mayor and the board of estimates reneged even after there was a recommendation from the city solicitor's office to settle it. We went to trial. We got a $500,000 verdict from a jury. The case went up on appeal, which was denied. And now the city is asking the highest court in the, in the state, the Court of Appeals, to review the case on the issue of whether or not the, the CAP, the court, the court of Special Appeals, ruled that the CAP was not applicable uh, to individual police officers. And in fact, the jury found malice. And in this particular case, the jury did find malice. And, but that case, it, it goes, it's the prime example of the establishment of falling in line with this blue badge, or this, 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 this circle of blue badge, in, in terms of deny everything, concede nothing, and everybody lie. Uh, 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 cover up, hide, instead of when certain things taking place, instead of the administration, the police department, the police commissioner, and the mayor's office saying, okay, this was a bad shooting, or it's wrong, let's prosecute the police department, and let's compensate the families for the damage done to them. We don't have that mental attitude, uh, not in this state, and obviously we don't have it in, in most of the nation. So, I, you know, we talked about this before, you know, you've been doing this for almost 42 years. What keeps you going, you know, as an attorney fighting these cases, sometimes an uphill battle? Well, I, I didn't, Steve, it wasn't my purpose to get, I was into civil rights in terms of Title VII and equal opportunity and what have you. This is something, as I say in my book, Under Color of Law, this is something that sort of developed in my practice over the years. In fact, I say in the book that this is the new civil rights issue of the 21st century. And it's, so it's not something that I looked at and, and intently went into it was something that just developed and as it developing uh, in its developing it was something that I couldn't shy away from uh, because I did always feel coming out of Harvard University Law School that I have a commitment to the community uh, and I saw that was based in civil rights and so when this new monster began to surface its ugly head uh, it was like uh, I was compelled to continue uh, in this area of litigation and uh, try to undo some of the wrongs that have been done and bring some justice to the community uh, even though the powers that be uh, stand strongly in opposition to that. Well, I read your book. I highly recommend it. And listen, Mr. Pettit, I really appreciate you talking with us about this. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, Steve. Good to see you. And my name is... Okay, well, we're not going to be able to play the, uh, the third video in that sequence. I guess I probably talked too much during this show. But uh, be sure to keep your eye on the TV guide for both September 11th, A New Pearl Harbor, and uh, The Anatomy of a Great Deception. I will be putting both of those on during the month of May. And uh, the studio's closed during the month of May, so I'll be putting on, I, I'm going to go through my archives and find some five or six year old shows and put those on as an example. So the, three, the next three shows, well, one more live show, and then the next three after that will be my canned shows. But right now, we're going to end the, uh, I'll probably come right back in a minute, but... Uh, we're going to play a clip from James Corbett. Now, we did one before just like this. It was called 9-11 Conspiracy in Five Minutes. Well, this is the Oklahoma City bombing conspiracy in five minutes. So go ahead and let her rip.
On the morning of April 19, 1995, a decorated Gulf War combat vet blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City using a truck bomb that he didn't build and a rider truck that he didn't rent with the help of a passenger who didn't exist. Having just gotten away with the largest act of terrorism on U.S. soil to date, the Fort Bragg trained Special Forces Sheep Drip Dropout blended in with the crowd by making his getaway in a car without a license plate and was immediately pulled over. The ATF was the supposed target of the attack, but luckily all of their agents were out of the office that morning. Later that day, the president boldly declared, We will find the people who did this. And when we do, justice will be swift, certain, and severe. Except for John Doe number two. John Doe number two. John Doe number two. Who, according to the FBI, never existed. In McVeigh's unprecedented three and a half week trial, the prosecution didn't show the CCTV footage of him and John Doe number two parking the rider truck. Didn't explain why 24 separate witnesses mass hallucinated the existence of John Doe number two didn't explain why the government was testing truck bombs and the army was storing rider trucks at Camp Gruber right before the bombing, and didn't talk to the FBI informants who blew the whistle on the plot. But they did collaborate with the CIA, and they did convict McVeigh as the lone wolf bomber and Terry Nichols as his bomb-constructing accomplice. Still, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists, including 300 bombing victims, insist on talking about facts and evidence and refuse to simply believe what they've been told a million times by people in tailored suits with well-coiffed hair. They quote the U.S. Army Brigadier General and the FBI Crime Lab whistleblower and the inventor of the neutron bomb who point out the physical impossibility that the Ryder truck bomb did the damage to the building, but that doesn't matter because if there were other bombs in the building that day, we would have heard about them. The second explosive was found and diffused. I think he said another bomb. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found. They then found a third device, which was also larger than the first. And I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb. The FBI claims to have lost the footage showing McVeigh and John Doe number 2, parking the truck in front of the Murrah building that morning, but that's understandable because the Bureau has a lot of important evidence to store. Terry Nichols insists the FBI was involved in the plot, but thankfully a judge has saved us the trouble of listening to him by preventing lawyers from deposing him. There was a bomb squad truck parked across the street two hours before the blast, but that just shows the authorities were prepared for anything. And... Other documents obtained by 2020 show that someone called the executive secretariat's office at the Justice Department in Washington and said the Morrow building had been bombed. But this was 24 minutes before the blast. But that just shows the public was unusually vigilant that morning. Also, apparently, before the bombing, Governor Frank Keating's brother, Mark, had been working on a novel about a terrorist bombing in Oklahoma City. Stranger still, one of the characters in the novel was named Thomas McVeigh. But that's probably just a coincidence. McVeigh wrote a letter to his sister where he admitted to being a secret special forces operative and he complained to friends of the pain in his ass from an army implanted microchip, but that's crazy because if he didn't actually leave the army in 1991, there would be proof of that. This man never existed, and if you say otherwise, you're a crazy government-hating nut job who deserves to be locked in a cage for the rest of your life. Likewise, him, her, them, her, and him and him and him. McVeigh was not executed on May 16, 2001 as scheduled because The FBI had failed to turn over thousands of pages of evidence to McVeigh's defense attorneys. But the execution went ahead on June 11th. In a highly unusual and secret agreement, no autopsy was performed, one witness said he was still breathing, and the prison officials admitted his hearse was a decoy. Then, the case was officially closed. This is the story of OKC as told to you by the same truth-tellers behind Perhaps a profoundly lonely man who craved attention but found consolation in doing good. And And the helicopter we were traveling in was forced down after being hit by an RPG. And We're, we're with the rebels. And he said, oh, you're with the rebels? And they started beating him. Oh, you're with the rebels? Don't you support Bashar? And if you question any part of this story, you are a paranoid wingnut birther truther tenther prepper conspiracy loon who should feel guilty for having been born. If you love baseball, fluffy kittens, hot dogs, Barbie, Star Wars, and freedom, you will never, ever bring up any of these points ever again. Ever. This message has been brought to you by the friends of the FBI, ATF, DOJ, CIA, SPLC, MSM, and the U.S. Army. And remember, ignorance is strength. Okay, ignorance is strength. Well, then I'm pretty strong. No, wait a minute. Okay, well, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say... Do you see in the uh, the black versus white thing that we were talking about just before this clip, do you see what the underlying saving grace is when there is a saving grace? It's somebody videoing the cops. The cops 
can get away with anything if they get to write the story. So get yourself a camera. Get yourself several cameras. Get yourself one. Of, they have a, a pen camera that you know takes high definition video, two hours worth. I think it's like 50 bucks. They have a wristwatch camera. I don't have one, but th these are things that you can have on your person and film, film, I mean, tape, tape, record, record, record. Okay, I'm, I'm an anachronism left over from the film era. But uh, record everything. And you might even begin to like photography as, as a hobby by itself. But every time you see anything, you know, go to, go to civil meetings. The, we have a, an activist here in Portland, Joe Anybody. He does the best job of filming the, uh, or documenting the actions of our city council, uh, bar none. There isn't any other activist that does as much as he does on that subject. Uh, but don't wait for somebody else to do it. Come down to Portland Community Media and get trained on making high definition television. You can interview people, you can show your own videos, you can create your own content, or you can just do it the lazy way like I do and let other people create it. But I do the editing. I, the editing. I select the stories that fit my point of view, and I select the stories that tell the story I want to tell. So in that respect, I am weaving a, a, an understanding, and uh, I guess that's somewhat of a service. But we need more people. I mean, what are you going to do when I get tired? We need more and more people. Come on down and run a camera. Come on down and operate the graphics you know it's it's amazing um, by the way I just made my own entry for this and if you didn't see it why don't we play that entry again just before we run the final credits it's about 38 seconds long and uh, then we'll play the final credits and we'll see you next Saturday